If you've played games like Asphalt, Brothers in Arms and Gangstar, it's safe to say you've heard about the company, Gameloft. It's one of the largest gaming companies in the world and is renowned for developing high quality mobile games. But for quite some time it has marked a decline, as observed by falling revenue and its games failing to draw people's interest. So what went wrong with Gameloft, which was considered one of the biggest mobile gaming companies around 2014 to 15, but is bleeding money at present? Let's learn about its rise and fall in today's video. First of all, let's discuss the origins of Gameloft. It was Mitchell Guillermo who founded the company in 1999. What you might not be aware of is that he was a co-founder of Ubisoft as well. It was essentially five brothers who came to found Ubisoft, and the Guillermo family was previously into agriculture, then computers, and now they've got this video game business. Anyway, Gameloft would go on to become the best mobile game studio in the world, with its games running into hundreds of millions of downloads and raking in big money. Let's have a closer look at how its games could achieve such success. Now, one common thing about a lot of Gameloft games is that they are inspired by some other PC or console game. For instance, the Gangstar series draws heavily from GTA, and we get to see similar 3D open-world crime gameplay. Zombie Infection shares a likeness with Resident Evil 5, and the Nova series is inspired by Halo, and Shadow Guardian from Uncharted. The list is fairly long. Although they were dubbed as clones of popular games, they suffered little competition since no developer made such fine games for the mobile platform, and this became their USP, where they brought out games resembling popular titles that people on their mobile phones could enjoy. Naturally, this drew some back Backlash. Like in November 2011, when Mitchell was asked to comment on their games being called out as clones. He answered that the video game industry rarely witnesses new concepts and that in a year only one or two fresh ideas surface around which games are built. Whether you agree with this reasoning or not, it is a fact that Gameloft titles, despite being clones, are top-notch. They have well-polished gameplay and offers a decent experience, sometimes even better than the original title. One thing we can all appreciate is that Gameloft did not monetize their games with advertisements. Now, a mobile game generates income by carrying ads, microtransactions, or retailing. Among the three, the developers steered clear of ads since they didn't want to ruin our experience, especially in the campaign game genre that Gameloft focused on. I mean, you could be merrily progressing in the game and suddenly a 30 second commercial would completely upset the flow. As such, where other games were making millions from ads, Gameloft believed that it would only encourage players to switch to a rival game. But it wasn't as if they relied on microtransactions, which were very few. They mainly retailed their games, where one had to make a payment for downloading the game. And that was it! This is why they made more money off the iOS editions, as someone who can afford an iPhone can spare a few bucks to acquire a game too. Between quantity and quality, Gameloft surely went with the latter. It's true that they have produced more than 190 games, but even then they try to focus on quality to offer the best possible experience to mobile gamers. In 2014, they said that their primary focus would be on quality. Then, the company produced a wide range of games, unlike From Software, which brought out exclusively Soulsborne titles, or Rockstar Games, which kept to the open-world crime genre. Gameloft was developing every kind of game, be it racing or FPS, open-world or even casual ones. Consequently, they enjoyed a much wider and more diverse consumer base. So these were the reasons behind the splendid success of Gameloft. But then, what followed in 2014-15 to that contributed to its downfall? I'd elaborate. There was a time when Gameloft used to proudly declare that their games didn't carry ads, but that approach came back to bite them, as they were seemingly not making enough. On the one hand, they were creating high-end games that required a lot of investment, but on the other, they did not fetch much. As such, profits dwindled and many had to suffer losses. Eventually, they set up Gameloft advertising solutions to run ads in their games. Also, trends were shifting in the mobile gaming sphere. While Gameloft kept releasing campaign games that were not free to play, freemium games had taken over that could be downloaded for free, and once the players got hooked on them, generated revenue from ads or microtransactions. More recent games included skins and other cosmetic items that were available for purchase. And battle passes were being given out for money. As a result, premium games from Gameloft lost out in sales. That's why, as you can see, the gangster games, which were earlier downloaded by paying money, can now be downloaded for free. But yeah, they now include ads and microtransactions. Gameloft's fall from glory is largely attributed to its hostile takeover by Vivendi. 
the French mass media giant had been aggressively seeking to expand into gaming. Before 2013, they owned Activision Blizzard, which split to become an independent publisher. With Gameloft, they uncharitably bought it over. This was during 2015 to 16, when Gameloft reported losses of over 16 million euros and was forced to close down seven of their studios within a year. So the company was in dire financial straits when Vivendi appeared on the scene with a helping hand. But Michel Guillermo was unaware of their real intentions. To begin with, Vivendi acquired a stake of 6% in Gameloft, then 10%, and by the end of February 2016, they had bought 30% of the company. Michel came to realize that Vivendi wouldn't stop there, and pleaded with shareholders not to sell the shares they owned, but by June, Vivendi had acquired a 56% stake in the company to become the majority shareholder. This prompted Michel to quit Gameloft and go over to Ubisoft, as it had dawned upon him that the takeover was the first move in a grand scheme to buy out Ubisoft. Not long after, 96% of Gameloft's shares had gone to Vivendi. Now, the thing is, when the entire upper tier management is swept, a company can often take a different turn in business. They adopt a different direction when creating new games. Gameloft 2 witnessed a change of course. It began to pursue modern trends. For instance, taking forward the Nova series, which had been immensely popular. Fans were widely anticipating the release of Nova Legacy. It came out, but not quite to their liking. It had few campaign missions and the entire push was toward microtransactions, as is vogue these days. Thus, the game did not appeal to true fans of the series. Alongside this, they halted updates on formerly released games. Now, mobile games require regular updates to render them compatible with newer handsets and to keep players interested. But faced with losses, they decided to pull the plug on certain games, like Nova 3, which is no longer available on mobile phones. Likewise, many fan favorites were retired. Apart from this, the competition in the market has also increased a lot. Previously, only a handful of mobile gaming studios existed, such as Rovio, Zynga, and Key. But presently, a good many have come up. So many mobile games are being developed in China, mostly by Tencent and NetEase. Even giant publishers have directed attention to the mobile gaming platform, like Activision bringing out COD Mobile, and Ubisoft porting its games to handheld devices. Similarly, many big PC and console games are being released for mobile. As such, the initial strategy that work for Gameloft, bringing out clones of popular games, might not work as well today. But it's not all downhill for Gameloft. Although their revenue has shrunk, their games continue to receive 1.5 million downloads every day and each month. More than 70 million people play them. The acquisition by Vivendi did land them in difficulties, with games going down in quality and the company not faring well. But things are much better now. In other news, the company is branching out to the PC platform. Disney Dreamlight Valley was their first PC game that saw fair success. And whereas other mobile gaming companies were losing revenue, Gameloft actually saw growth. Another thing that it had going for them was that since they brought out high quality games, players on PC and consoles thought to try their debut game expecting the same level of brilliance. In spite of their decline on the mobile platform, they're geared to expand into gaming across PC and console. Gangstar New York is a testimony to that. So that was the story of Gameloft. To learn of such a story about Hill Climb Racing 3, click on the video to the left. And to know how China controls our gaming industry, watch the video on the right. If you enjoyed this one, add a like and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next video. Till then, adios.